So, a very warm welcome to this session. Um, we have two distinguished speakers who I'll introduce in a moment. And before we do, I'll introduce the topic very briefly. Um, we've heard a lot about artificial intelligence, and particularly artificial intelligence in the fields of technology, engineering, but especially in the private sector. Many corporations are using it for predictive models, um, but governments seem very reluctant to use it. And here we've got a number of factors. We have the privacy, access to data, which we're going to talk more about, and of course, resources, um, having sk skilled staff able to address these issues. This panel discussion aims to tease out some of those challenges with government use of artificial intelligence. We'll be drawing on the context um, and expertise from our distinguished panel of international experts. Um, so for this discussion, I'd like to introduce very briefly our two panelists. First of all, Ms. Arvin Schmidt, um, who's originally from the Netherlands, and she is now based in Singapore, so we're starting east, and she's the author of a very relevant book on the whole topic of privacy and artificial intelligence. It's called Identity Reboot, and that basically examines how the breakdown of personal data privacy is being exploited from the profit and power perspective. So that's the sort of background in terms of her academic publishing the book. But she's also very active now in the strategy side of artificial intelligence. And I'm sure she'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so Miss Arvin Schmidt from originally the Netherlands, based in Singapore. Thank you for joining us so early in the morning there. Um, and our second distinguished panelist is Mr. Abdulaziz Al-Bakar, um, who is originally from Saudi Arabia. He has been working in the technology field for many, many years. Um, he's a business leader with experience in international contexts. He's focusing on strategic management um, in consultancy, and he's now speaking from London, where he's currently following a, uh, an executive program at the London Business School. So welcome to both of you, and thank you to Harassis for putting together such a distinguished panel of experts. So I'd like to and maybe start, well, ladies first, with um, Arvin. Um, Arvin, you know, we mentioned your book, and you've, um, you've got this, um, a lot of evidence collected in your book, Identity Reboot. How can citizens, um, really, how can their acceptance of IEA, artificial intelligence, be improved and, and also related to this, what really are the concrete benefits and what benefits are possible for citizens based on AI in the public sector? So really focusing on the public sector here. So, Arvin, um, over to you for a short rundown of your take on those two points. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So if we break it down and we look at AI in the public service, I think we need to start with three questions. So first of all, what is it? What are we talking about? Then from there, is it universally a good thing? And if the answer to that is maybe sometimes, how do we preserve the good and contain the bad? So in this very brief introduction, I'll just focus on the first two questions. So what is it? And is it universally a good thing? So what do we know so far before we look at the future? Now, you did mention the, the book. And in, in my own research, um, I classify it as follows. So I believe wholeheartedly that data privacy precedes the capability to make up one's mind across the spectrum of 
alternatives. And then from there, that it will influence your ability to act accordingly. Now, if you believe that, um, I propose that human behavior could actually be at risk of becoming an optimization game for either profit or power. So if we start with profit, uh, what we've seen, uh, we've seen the application and the immersion of profit games to enable an extractive data economy for shareholder purposes. And then on the power games, which is the interest of our panel today, is that we've seen the leveraging of for profit and public infrastructure for national strategy purposes. So whenever we start talking about the application of AI in public service, well, we should always wonder is what are the national strategy purposes and what is the philosophical and value-based compass that is attached to that? Now, if we explore that a little bit further, what is very relevant is that we're actually dealing with three different value systems. So you have the value system of the EU that is more focused on individual rights and their relationship to privacy. So there is a type of agreement there that individuals have a right to privacy. Then you have the US on the other side of the Atlantic that is more focused on this trade-off between privacy and security. That's the driving and guiding factor there. And then all the way on the other side, you have China that is more focused on using data to create cohesion, to create uniformity, and from there, build trust. So if we're already seeing that in these very distinct value systems that are all exported with services and products in, in, in their own uh, specific ways, we must always be cautious of how AI would used, be used in public service because the exact same app or the exact same service might have very different uh, implications if you would take it out of a certain context and place it in, in another. And I think that touched upon the question, like, is it universally good to have AI in public service? And that very much depends on uh, your implementation and who you're asking. Excellent starting point. And um, the three different value systems, um, if I understand you correctly, there doesn't seem to be any sort of cohesion as such between those three. They're quite different from each other. And, and maybe we could um, come back to those later. Um, so you meant you highlighted the different value systems in the EU, those in the US and those in China. Um, um, and we can come back there. Um, so Abdul Aziz, um, basically, I'd like to ask you the same question to start with. Um, and in your experience, um, you, I think you've also had uh, a little bit of experience in public sector projects um, in different contexts. Uh, how do you see real uh, citizens' acceptance of AI and how can it be improved? Um, you're from a different part of the world than that was mentioned, not uh, the EU as such and not China or the US. So... How do you see, maybe linking back to what Arvin has, has mentioned, how do you see um, concrete benefits and are these possible for citizens really based on AI in the public sector? This is what we're focusing on. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I did a lot of uh, digital transformation projects with the public sector, whether it's services, utilities, or different areas. And uh, to be honest, it reminds uh, when we talk about AI now for the public sector, uh, it reminds me of the beginning when we were trying to uh, push for the automation, the e enterprise resource planning, ERP, and so on. There was a lot of resistance because people or employees, the users, and even some of the managers would think that this computer system would replace them. And once it's implemented successfully, the, the, the organization would reduce the manpower and they would end up without a job. And uh, 
it took, uh, and that's the same thing right now. Uh, same thing, and, and that's one of the reasons why uh, public services organizations don't do it, be, don't implement or utilize the AI solutions. Is they're afraid that that AI will replace the jobs and make a reduction in the jobs. Uh, as as citizens, they 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 benefit from the automation. Uh, greatly, and we do have a uh, digitalization of a lot of most of the government entities. So, uh, citizens now they have more uh, example bills, utility bills, and so on. It's more accurate. It's timely, and the data is uh, is ready, uh, or it's accessible. Uh, so they benefited from that. They they finish whatever the, the request, the citizen request in a timely manner. They know where it is. The workflow is identified. Where is my request? Who is it with? Where is it pending? With the AI, but, but this automation that we're living in still requires a big number of manpower to support it and to operate it. Now, with the AI, citizens can get the answers they want and get the responses and the customer service and the feedback with, uh, in minutes, and they can get it 24 by 7. Because just an example, if we have the, the citizen interaction side managed by the AI, and that all of that is integrated in the back office, with the back office, imagine that citizens can send SMS messages to that public sector agency or chatting or emails, they, they would get a prompt response within a few minutes. And depending on the system and how you do it and how you implement it and the parameters for it, but you would get at least, at least a minimum of uh, f uh, 30 to 40% increase in the efficiency of and the satisfaction of the citizens. So, it is a good thing, but the citizens won't know. They won't know what's behind that. Is it a human being or is it an AI and so on? So, uh, but the rejection or the acceptance will have to come from the public sector uh, management and users. So maybe that leads into the point about um, from acceptance. I think we've heard. Um, you know, a sort of cautious approach, but also um, one which you highlight benefits there. Um, what about acceptance then? I think, you know, we're, we're sort of, there's a policy level, which I understand um, for Marvin is, is not really so harmonized depending on the geographical region. Um, so there are quite a few differences there. Um, in my experience in Switzerland, for example, where I'm based, um, there's quite, um, a sort of a, a movement towards, um, you know, access and uh, to AI, but there's a cautious approach as well. Um, is is are we suggesting that you know there's more education necessary here, or is it more a question of aligning policies? From what Arvin said right at the start, there's these differences between mm -hmm. geographical regions in the world. Um, and, and the EU, for example, and the US and China having clear differences. Um, and you also mentioned, you know, these national strategies. Um, I, I don't, it's not really um, a subject that I, I, I know so much about, but are we suggesting there needs to be more done in publishing of national strategies? I mean, are countries really ready to go forward with um, their policies yet? Or, or does there need to be something that, that's a little bit more um, higher level from what you've said, Arvin. Let me ju jump in there then. Yeah. Um, so actually the uh, Trade and Technology Council was recently announced between um, the US, in, in my understanding, and the EU. And this council is working on um, inter-Atlantic uh, cooperation um, across various technologies and AI is one of them. And to date, 
to my understanding, the progress of the Council so far on this very topic is a joint statement that they would work towards common metrics and methodologies on the trustworthiness of AI. And uh, there are two takeaways there. So first of all, um, it's really hard to agree on what those metrics and methodologies should be. Um, second of all, the key word there is trustworthiness. So what type of processes, what types of queries can we trust AI um, to make, to automate or to make decisions on? Now, if you, if you break it down, AI is a term that is very loosely thrown around. There was a crazy study in the UK that said maybe that 80% of the companies that use the term AI are actually not using the AI technology at all. Like we're talking about self-learning systems. Now, if the systems are self-learning, they can be self-learning in a number of different ways. They can be self-learning um, in, for example, option A, that they can discriminate across a larger and larger and more and more diverse set of information. They can refine their own rule engine. That's, that's another option. Um, and so forth and so forth. Now, I don't think that there is consensus um, in the public sector on what types of decisions would lend it themselves well for that type of automation. Um, and at the same time, if we would implement it, then A, what is the level of explainability that is required for those decisions? Are we okay with a black box type of scenario? And if not, what is the level of explainability and transparency that we need in order to get buy-in um, from the people um, those decisions actually in, involve. Um, and second of all, what is the level of authorization that is needed to deploy such systems? Is that set on public sector level or would that be set on an individual level? And to give you a more concrete example, how would we deal with, for example, um, UBI allocation, uh, universal basic income? Is that a type of decision that we would trust to such systems? Is that maybe even better? And if so, on what basis? Those are very nuanced decisions, very nuanced conversations with many, many, many trade-offs. Um, and I feel that um, generally, it's a type of blue sky scenario. Of course, AI has benefits. And of course, those benefits also reside in the public sector. But it's not a blanket check. It's not uh, a, uh, a technology that, or a, a type a type set of technologies that you can apply to every situation and that it will all work out fine. Because it, it definitely won't. And it's a thought fallacy um, to deploy it in that manner. Thank you for that explanation. So um, it seems as though the sort of sense of the sensitivity and the sort of uh, relevance of AI to particular uh, public sector areas uh, might be more than controversial. Um, you sort of mentioned a few of them uh, where there may not be um, so broad an acceptance. Uh, would you like to comment on that, Abdulaziz? Any any feedback on your part? Yes, I think. Uh, in the public sector, and especially with uh, areas where you're dealing with services to citizens, you would uh, utilize the AI in a way to support the decision making, ra rather than uh, allowing it to do to make decisions. So, uh, uh, and before that, you would define. The, and build the ethical and lawful AI. And one of it is as a policy or a regulation is uh, when you implement it, you have a strategy and a framework for, for it to support the decision making, to, uh, to be able to extract and gather the data and do the analysis 
to support the decision maker to uh, to apply whatever is needed uh, to apply. That's one thing. Another thing is one thing uh, the citizens, the decision makers should should understand uh, is that uh, AI uh, is going to be implemented as an augmentation of the human resources. So it's it's not replacing, it's helping to improve the efficiency. And another thing is the governments, not all governments have strategies, have entities specialized in this area, but for me as a citizen, when I see my government uh, re releasing strategies about the AI and creating some centers or agencies about AI and big data, that gives me comfort and that gives me kind of uh, uh, that they are on track and they know what's going on in this area. Like in Saudi Arabia, we have a, a uh, the government has initiated and created a, uh, uh, an entity that is responsible for research and implementation of AI and big data across uh, all government entities. And that's a big thing uh, because it shows that they want to utilize it for the benefit of the, the citizens. And for me as a citizen, I wouldn't uh, be scared from the word AI when you mention it because a lot of people, they get scared. They have the right to be scared but uh, because uh, they don't know what it does. So awareness plays in uh, here. This is where you, once you give awareness, there is good and bad. It's at the end, it's, an, it's a software. Whether you use, you use it for the good of people or you can use it for, uh, for criminal activities, exactly like the hacking. Hackers, they use software to hack the, uh, the websites and systems. It's a software. And on the other side, we have software that is being used to protect these organizations and to do the productivity and so that we can meet all of us together on online in different areas. This is all software enabled. Thank you, Abak Aziz. Um, so we're touching on uh, different aspects. Um, and I think, um, you know, you mentioned governments and, and almost sort of hinting that there are some countries that are perhaps um, more ready and are more uh, advanced, um, but I would sort of maybe question that uh, readiness advancement in the context of what we just heard from Arvin, that maybe um, the more advanced governments technologically may not be those that are more advanced in the sense of societal uh, openness and transparency. Is is that a kind of a fair comment, Arvin, or how do you see that in, in the work that you've, in the research that you've done? I think there are arguments um, for and against that statement. Um, you are actually seeing, if you take uh, the government of the Netherlands, uh, where I'm from, as an example, um, that there is a, a strategy being developed, but this is more on city by city level, where cities are trying to have a dialogue with their inhabitants on how algorithms are deployed in daily life. So in Amsterdam specifically, they launched an algorithmic register and the purpose of that algorithmic register is threefold. So first of all, to provide essential context of how the algorithms are deployed on city level to rebuild public trust. Think facial recognition on cameras. If there will be context provided where that is active, why it is active, what the purposes are um, of the deployment of that specific set of technologies. Um, secondly, what it allows you to do is to create a feedback loop with citizens. Um, and that could create legitimacy uh, going forward for the deployment of such technologies. And uh, thirdly, 
what it could allow you to do is uh, it gives an avenue to introduce new standard clauses in governmental procurement contracts that impose a duty of care, a duty of cooperation onto the vendor. So this is something you can do on a very small level, for example, on a, on, on a city by city level. So I know Amsterdam um, has already tested this, Barcelona is looking at it. But if you look at the level of uh, nation states, that will always be governed by uh, a national agenda. Now, what the AI strategy might be on, uh, on the national agenda, if you look, for example, at, at national security might be very far removed of how an AI app obviously would work on universal basic income. So we have to separate those things. Like, are we using um, AI for the optimization of processes or are we using um, AI to create a pool of data that can also be used for different ends? Like those are two different but related conversations. So the actual um, local level sort of uh, approach that you highlighted that I mean I mean we're talking about open governance here aren't we using uh, we're sort of opening up uh, specific areas of data to pretty much everyone everyone is that is that do I understand that correctly um, it's definitely governing by with transparency in mind so you are removing AI from its black box and you are reintroducing that context. And by reintroducing that context, you uh, create an, an additional avenue for the legitimacy of that specific use. And if it indeed has a benefit, and if people's values align uh, with the parameters of that deployment, then it's absolutely a huge success. Fascinating. Well, it would not be uh, a, a great implementation if it's, if it's deployed without consent. Um, and that the parameters for the decisions um, that are spit out are um, not transparent, but also that there is no recourse to, to open the box back up um, and to explore what those uh, inputs and, and, and the variables were. Fantastic. Because that's how you get racism and discrimination. Um, and there's nothing you can do about it, as an example. Well, that's a good example. And I like um, the example of, uh, you mentioned Amsterdam. It, it, is that sort of something that is considered as a, a sort of a model um, step yes, forward? It's, it's absolutely a model. Uh, so there's actually a, a consortium of various cities, and this was first tested to my knowledge in Amsterdam, um, and many other cities that are currently looking at it, amongst which uh, London and, and Barcelona. Thank you. Um, Another topic, I mean, we were really touching on this sort of topic of governance and leadership. Um, I'd like to, and, and Abdel Aziz, you, you've also been active a lot in uh, leadership and strategy. How do you see this whole sort of question of leadership? It's linked in a way to what we've just heard, um, maybe sort of introducing things slowly at a, a local, maybe city level. What about leadership itself? Is that something that you see as being crucial here in, in this sort of um, process um, in, in your experience of, of a business leader? Well, of course, uh, leadership is everything because if, uh, if there is no leadership in this initiative and in introducing it on the national and the local level and even on the agency levels, uh, these programs or these initiatives won't see success. There has to be sponsorship. They have to respond. The, the, leaders, uh, the leaders must understand, they have to understand the value, that the added value that it's going to uh, put. And they have to clarify that uh, the doubts that the beneficiaries, the citizens, the users, will have about these kind of solutions or technologies like the AI. Uh, we going, uh, so once there's a sponsorship, that enables the change, that enables the acceptance also, or let's call it, as they call it in the change management, the buy-in. 
once there is a buy-in, then people get uh, and organizations would start working on it. And even on the local level, if you go out from, let's say, as a public a uh, services agency, if, uh, if there is a leadership uh, that set the role and then they set certain areas, how they can benefit from the local companies, the universities, and the research areas that are working on AI and how they can include all of that and so that you can grow it and develop that technology with on a local base. Uh, so leadership is very essential because if there isn't a leadership that sets a strategy, then you're going to have a problem in, uh, in that you're going to have competing and contradicting with uh, different uh, plans or initiatives. And there might not be a set of rules, which is very important when, when you uh, adopt uh, implementing a new technology. Regulations are very important. Uh, talking about the ethical criteria and the lawful criteria, making sure that uh, there is uh, uh, inclusivity, diversity, and all of that is uh, is embedded in the system. Not the racism and favorism is embedded in the system because uh, at the end, any system can be manipulated. So yeah, there has to be uh, what you what I call it is uh, rather than the legal looking at it from a legal, is quality assurance. Quality assurance of, uh, of uh, and compliance of the AI system and the algorithms that manage and control and process the data. So on an adjacent uh, note, I actually want to make an argument in favor of AI in, in public service. Uh, so what we're seeing at the moment, um, partly because of uh, geopolitical developments, is that a lot of different countries are embarking on building their own tech stack. Um, and that this has a different impulse. The impulse is not necessarily modernization um, or even efficiency or effectiveness. The input is rather being self-reliant and it's, it's, it's very much driven uh, by a need for self-preservation from a national security perspective. So you see this happening in Russia, you see this happening in China, but you also uh, see this happening in India. Uh, and India started this process maybe 10, 10-ish years ago uh, when they started rolling out um, Adhar, their identity layer. They have since complemented that with... Um, quite well implemented, I must say, levels of financial infrastructure. So you see that various countries are building their own tech stack. And once you have that tech stack, it will be a lot easier to, in a more targeted manner, introduce real artificial intelligence. So in my view, the more narrow those applications can be, um, the, the more future-proof they likely are. Thank you. And, and that's an interesting point. Um, India with ADAR um, and, and the sort of introduction of that as a national system, as their tech stack. Um, are you suggesting that was a, a fairly, I mean, that's, as you say, I think 10 years old now. And I think they built on that. They really achieved a huge um, engagement from their population. Uh, I think it's almost sort of uh, 1.3 billion of, uh, you know, almost the whole population are on it. Are you suggesting that that is a sort of an approach? Because um, you mentioned before the Netherlands is starting off with a sort of city local approach. Um, and and then you're comparing that now uh, to the Adar in India. Is that is there a sort of a, any lessons learned from from both of these um, approaches? Yeah, I would say you have very different starting points uh, because what India is able to do is they can deploy a very narrow solution and it can work immediately because you already have all the various components in place. Whereas if you would take uh, an opt-in approach um, where you have to start from scratch, 
it can take a little while before you get to that level of buy-in uh, until you reach a certain level of effectiveness. Because AI is not a solution that works for one person. You need a certain type of representative uh, mass or community or a sample uh, before it starts making sense uh, at all. Thank you. That is uh, very fitting. And I think, uh, you know, go, we do a lot of work in India and seeing the uh, ATAR system in use, it, it seems to be very effective and uh, they use it for sort of things like benefits payments. Of course, they've got um, the whole thing system linked uh, to the thumbprint and things like that. So it does actually, it's very well considered for those people who may not be banked, for example, the unbanked. So I, I like that example. Uh, Abdul Aziz, any any comments on on those sort of approaches that we've heard from Arvin? Uh, I think right now there has been. It's if we look at the automation, the software automation, when it started, there was a few. It was very hard to develop. ERP enterprise application. It was based on in the beginning on mainframes and it, it costed millions and millions. And to get the right caliber, it was very hard and so on. And uh, not all countries would, uh, would be able. It took them a few years. There was always a gap uh, of 10 to 15 years between the, con uh, the developing countries and the developed countries in getting the automation, the software automation. Nowadays, it's different. Now you have a lot of uh, strong and credible development platforms for AI applications. So you don't have to go and spend all of those years or, or all of those millions on developing an application that you want. And as, uh, as was mentioned, uh, especially if you are looking for a focused uh, functionality, if you want certain functionality, that's the best way to go for it is to utilize these development platforms. And tens of companies, the big and the, and the let's say Microsoft has a, a platform for AI, IBM, uh, Google, and all of the big names, they have developed that. Additionally, SAP also has AI embedded within their modules. You can utilize it. Uh, and the beauty about these is that because you need it to be integrated with other areas like the IoT, with blockchain, and with the back office data. Now, Going beyond these big names, you find smaller companies and mid-sized companies that also have developed these things. Going further, now you have applications with, which has AI capabilities that you can develop, as they call it, zero-code development platforms. So I don't need to be a developer to, to, uh, to implement or add an AI capability that I want to my company, to my organization. There is zero code and there is the low code the development platforms. So nowadays it's different than before. It's much easier. It's accessible, the technology, and it costs less. And, and you don't need that much of uh, manpower to reach it. But you have to do it the right way. You have to implement it in an agile methodology and see what's the best practices and implement it, see the successful cases that has been done and, and do, uh, try to uh, implement the same and see the failures and try to avoid those. Thank you. So I think that's a crucial point, do it the right way. And we're just trying to tease out a few sort of um, different scenarios. And I think we've heard a number of them. Uh, for example, the approach taken at a local level in the Netherlands, um, the approach uh, taken by the Indian government some time ago. It, it seems to me there's not a sort of a one-size-fits-all. Um, it does depend on a number of different things. But um, 
you know, you mentioned these three sort of um, value systems right at the start, um, Arvin, and you talked about the EU and the US and, and China. Um, is there sort of, I mean, you mentioned that also uh, there are ways of sort of people coming together uh, that through the sort of Trade and Technology Council, for example, where people are discussing. Is that, how would you suggest that, um, you know, for example, now citizens uh, approach this? Is this something that, you know, citizens should should really um, be reading up about and, and finding out about? It sounds as though in the Nether- Netherlands they were well informed for that dialogue. I mean, they must have um, been informed. In a, is education an important part of this this whole process? I would say people in the Netherlands are reasonably well informed. I wouldn't say universally <laughs> across the board. I wouldn't dare to make that that comment. Well, actually, my um, my my advice to public service professionals and citizens would be very much the same. I think that for AI apps in the public service to succeed, you will need three components. So, first of all, there's the consent layer that gives the the algorithmic uh, application its legitimacy. So this consent layer deals with information. So do you consent, you as your personal data, do you want to be the input of this set of, uh, of rules? And then is there consent to abide by the output, by the authorization? Uh, so let's say there is a, an AI application in the justice system. Um, do you consent to be both the input and the output of that very decision? Do you consent to be both the input and the output of the universal basic income decision? And you will very quickly come to the second component. Um, yes, but only if there is a recourse option. So if you're the exception to that rule, it should be, it should be possible to open the black box, as it were, to introduce those elements of explainability. And what it will quickly come down to is this. Um, algorithms must understand the values that we try to communicate, but not set them. They should not go go rogue if you want to be very dramatic um, about it. And there needs to be very much visibility into the results. And the third component is discourse. So we need to be able to collectively have a decision if the rules that we've input, the rules that we've applied, are still the right rules to uh, to abide by. So where do we need certainty? Where do we need probability? Those decision sets matter a lot. Um, we can do all kinds of clever things to to correct for this. We can use counterfactual explanations. We can use inverse reinforcement learning. It's a bit of a bit of out of scope of our discussion today. But the bottom line is that there needs to be uh, elements of consent, recourse, and and discourse for any successful AI application. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that's almost a summing up, actually. <laughs> I was gonna, uh, making notes, but I think um, we can treat that as a summing up. Uh, after the least, um, any any final comments in the last minute um, on your on your part? I think we really heard some very good advice there. Um, those three uh, different points: the consent layer, is there the consent to the output, and then the algorithms. So they must really understand our values. Any final comments on your part? I think uh, we shouldn't worry a lot about it because more, there's studies that talk about. Uh, how AI will take over, you're going to need UBI and so on. Uh, but that's uh, that's one way of looking at it. But if we look at the uh, Industrial Revolution, what happened is jobs, there was a reduction in jobs in a certain area and it shifted to other areas. So this is what's going to happen. Actually, we're going to have better GDP and so on. Uh, all of these are important things we should uh, things we should highlight and look at it and embrace this technology and see how it can benefit and uh, make it much more easier to understand for for the decision makers that are not specialized in IT they don't have to be specialized in IT to utilize it and to make decisions about implementing 
Excellent. Also, uh, excellent final comments from you up to today's disease. I'd just like to thank you both now uh, for this excellent panel, this enriching discussion. And um, Oasis has really put together uh, really distinguished experts here. And I think we've all learned a lot. Um, we've had different approaches. We've had um, comments from different geographical regions. I've really enjoyed the discussion. So thank you very much indeed and wish you all the best for the rest of Horasis. And uh, I'm just about to start teaching now. So <laughs> all the very best. Take care, everyone. Bye for thank now. You. I'll stop streaming. Thank you. Bye-bye.